Welcome to the Extra Dimension. This episode is on the topic of distributed social networks. And just like the topic, we are distributing this episode across two halves. But they're both in the same MP3 file. Don't worry about that. In the first half, I will be talking to Brian Mitchell about the general theory of distributed social networks. And then in the second half, I will bring on Brandon Johnson to talk about uh, some specific examples uh, of the concept at work. By the way, I am Ian R. Buck. Uh, find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED21. All right, Brian, uh, can we agree that distributed social networks is a mouthful and we should just call them DSNs from now on? That sounds like an excellent idea. <laughs> All right, so DSNs, what the heck does this mean? And why is it different? What makes it different than a regular social network that we usually think of? Well, a, a DSN is a system where the, the, I guess, the servers that store all of the information are not on one location. So think of something like Facebook. Facebook owns mm-hmm. all of the, the space and the physical space and the, and the, um, the ways they're all connected that stores everything that makes up Facebook. Now, something yeah, and, in, and even though technically Facebook has lots and lots of different servers in different parts of the world, they still own every single one of them. Yep, it acts as, as one central repository. Mm-hmm. So a, a DSN is where there's a system where there are these servers run by different organizations and users can interact with each other across different servers. Yep. So another way you can think about it is it's kind of like an email in a way which is another distributed messaging system. You have your email hosted on Gmail or Yahoo or your work's email or a school email address. And they or are... heck, your, your own SMTP server if you want to set it up. Yes, definitely. Well, there are trust issues there, which we can uh, discuss at some point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so you have these servers just talking over a protocol that, and then everyone just kind of happily says, all right, do some verification, and then you are allowed to talk to a different service. It's... You know, and it's kind of similar like um, like Skype. Well, at one point, Skype or FaceTime, you're you're talking the peer-to-peer versus going through one central place. You can have, um, or I guess IRC is a good a good source because you might, well, no, that's connected through a server. Email <laughs> is a good example. It's Yeah, it's really tough to come up with uh, examples of this because... Most of the modern internet, most of the services that we're used to interacting with these days are centralized services, right? Um, as an entire industry, uh, podcasting is, you know, decentralized, right? Um, whereas, like, video on YouTube is centralized. So, um, so that would be that would be a not a not a communication like one to one communication example, but a a publication example of, of a distributed system right there yeah and um i think when what you and brandon are going to talk about in the the second half is um, mastodon as an example and mm-hmm. um, that kind of works where you have you know a central server that you are on but those servers can all talk interact with each other so you're you're not di- directly connecting to other peers necessarily or something like BitTorrent. you are you are um going directly to that person you're not passing all of your information through a central tracker or something and so um it's it's a little more cent it's centralized distribution not quite peer to peer right yep yep um and some people might have heard of social media aggregators um and that's definitely different than a dsn um, because social media aggregators just help you to manage like multiple accounts from multiple different social media platforms um i imagine that you would use this if you worked at uh you know a larger company and you man and and you're in charge of uh you know cross-posting things and yeah doing doing branded stuff um All right, so what are some pros and cons of using a DSN versus using a centralized system? Well, Um, yeah. Uh, In theory, it helps bring controls back to the users rather than a single single organization that owns the entire experience. Um, So you can have some some choice. You can say, I want, you can choose to use one provider versus another if there's some unique features on those um, locations. Um, Mm -hmm. 
and it's yeah and and you can choose them based on like what their user uh, agreements are right you know because if i want to use facebook i have no choice but to uh you know accept the terms of service that they have on there whereas uh you know if i wanted to have control of the terms of service for for my own server uh on a on a dsn i can totally do that yeah so say one one uh dsn has a or one server of a dsn has crazy good analytics and and you know you need to track your users to do that so you can see all these metrics and another one might be like you know we don't store anything you just you do what you want we're just providing this for you there's Mm -hmm. we're not tracking anything and so that lets people kind of decide on what they want yep um it's also a really interesting system from like a a political uh organization standpoint because it's a lot harder for like oppressive regimes to block access uh or for them to track everybody who is using a dsn um since you know like if if they find one server that's that's uh hosting stuff um and then they block it everybody can just move to a different server uh and uh and it's nice and nice and fluid that way yeah definitely total service outages are also less likely because the content that users have are stored on different servers depending on where that user is uh, hosted on. So if you know a certain server goes out, then maybe others won't be able to see what they have and those users won't have access, but the entire network will still function. Just a portion mm-hmm. of it will be out. Yep. And that's... Um... We can think of email again as as a good example of that. You know, if like Microsoft servers go go offline for a little while, um, none of the Hotmail users will be able to like log in and see their messages. But uh, I don't need to worry about that as a Gmail user because you know I already have like messages from them. I just won't be able to send stuff to them for a little while until their servers come back up. Yep. Yep. Um. And, uh, yeah, in, in the case of a DSN, um, yeah, if a particular server goes offline, then, then we won't be seeing, like, updates from any of the accounts on that server. Um, and actually, depending on how exactly the system is set up, I'm not sure if we would be able to still see, like, uh, past posts either. Depends on how, like, the caching works. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that would be up to implementation. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, let's talk about some cons of DSNs then. Um, so it's an it's a possibly more confusing system for a user to uh, to deal with, right? Because um, if you want to like e- even just from from the get go, if you want to sign up for Twitter, you know where to go. Twitter, Twitter dot com. There you go. If you want to sign up for something like Mastodon, um, then you have to do some research. You have to figure out like okay what servers are available what do each of them offer me what is the you know what are the differences there what am i missing out on by choosing one over the other uh which ones of them are actually accepting new users at the current (laughs) time um (laughs) yeah um and then you know even one even once you're using it you have to kind of wrap your head around the fact that the the full global community is not quite a global community because not all servers are necessarily communicating with all of the other servers and so you're not sure um how much of the full the full conversation you're getting yeah yeah and because it's distributed and you don't have a central uh place for kind of all knowledge and your verification spot um some features are more infeasible so things like ver- verified accounts where you have someone who said yep you're good you get it you get your blue check that's not really possible in something like this mm-hmm. unless there's a agreed upon co- a, an agreed upon protocol that um everyone has to implement in order to do this and then each i think each thing when you don't have to be trusted and so it becomes much more difficult when you have so many players involved right. now there are some uh workarounds like a uh, friend of the show, Max Fierke, has a, a uh, emoji or check a uh, checkbox character in his username. So he's he's totally verified. Yeah, that's, checks out. I, <laughs> that, I think that's one of my favorite like little in jokes on on Mastodon right now is uh, that you know new users come in and they're like, "Oh man, this person's verified," and it's like, "No, uh, no, buddy, they're not." <laughs> but if everyone is verified, is anyone verified? Wow, that is that is some. Uh, 
in- Incredibles stuff right there. Straight out of the movie. Yep. Um, I'm also wondering if adding new features to a distributed social network would be more difficult than a centralized one because like if if the developer of the protocol adds some new stuff do we have to wait for each admin to update their server to match you know um is is there is there a requirement for all servers to update within a certain amount of time how would you enforce that kind of thing i you know it's uh it has a potential to be a mess yeah, it has the you know the out of the right out of the gate it has the same difficulties that any social network might have, where you have clients that might be out of date. So you know if the old versions of the Twitter app may no or may not work with Twitter, but so eventually they have to have a cutoff. But yeah, when you have so many players involved and so many dependencies all over the place, it becomes mm-hmm. difficult to add new features and enforce changes and deprecations and things. And yeah, it, and yeah. and like having. A- individual users clients uh out of date is an entirely different story i think than having whole servers that are out of date yeah it it means you need to have backwards compatibility across old endpoints on old versions regardless or not if they're buggy so you might have a middle layer between that and your actual data store and communication just to resolve bugs and catch issues and things like that so it becomes much more complicated so something Mm -hmm. that i thought of that this could be kind of related to is again email the imap protocol where a lot of email clients um at least that i've seen on mac os and ios less so now but a couple of years ago there were a huge um a, a bunch of new apps came out from like dropbox and a couple other groups of just new email apps that implement imap so kind of your standard uh email protocol that's been out for years and years and, but they're adding these new features on top of it. So things like using the data that the clients have, what cool things can you do with that? So priority emails. Um, before, the, before the show, you were mentioning things like um, adding tracking information for packages or uh, seeing there's a flight in your email. So we're going to add an event that you have a flight at this time. Things like that mm-hmm. that can enhance the experience but doesn't break or change the underlying protocol at all. And that can be a way for each of these... Um, um, nodes on the DSN to distinguish themselves and try to get new users and push for change and enhancements overall. Yeah, which is really cool, um, but at the same time adds to the trouble of like it being confusing for for users because uh, you know trying to explain to my parents like why I might have a different set of features than them be- because they're on a different server than me um, would be pretty tough, I think. Yeah, I'm curious how how much these will be catching on. My my hunch is not much, just in the developer circle or tech yeah. circle. And I mean, people get confused enough when they see like uh, me using Phoenix, and they're like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "I'm I'm tweeting," and they're like, "That's not Twitter." Yeah, oh, I've tried to convince so many people to use Tweetbot or another third party app, and it's difficult, especially yeah. when it has no poll support. I'm <laughs> Twitter. Get on that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, On the other hand, a DSN is like the perfect grounds for uh, for some really cool like, you know, clients to be to be created because by necessity, like the entire API is going to be um, always supported. You know, (laughs) they're not going to lock down portions of it for like their their first party apps or anything like that. Um, And uh, and so we've seen some some crazy things being done like somebody made um a a mastodon client for emacs for example uh which (laughs) which is insane um yeah and i'll i'll talk more about those i think uh with brandon i'm sure that he uh (laughs) he'll have some enthusiastic thoughts uh on that subject for us now one thing that i did think of is um you you might go down the path of thought that's saying like so dsns are like email and obviously email is like ubiquitous right literally if you use the internet you probably have an email address you Um, pretty much need one to use any other feature of the internet pretty much yep so so does that mean that it is inevitable that we will have widespread adoption of distributed social networks uh and my conclusion is is no 
not really. <laughs> the success of email does not uh, tell us much about the possible success of DSNs. Um, and yeah, what you said about you need an email address to use most of the other features of the internet, that is the reason really that email is still universal. Um, I think it was universal originally because it was like the only feasible way for people to communicate in the early days of the internet. Um, and because of the nature of the early internet, of course, it was a distributed system, right? Because we had uh, a bunch of different universities and government agencies uh, all with their own servers. And so if you wanted to send a message to somebody who wasn't in your own company, it definitely had to be on a standard set of protocols. And people's servers then were just their, their desk computer. Sometimes they had to turn it off or run another program back before mm -hmm. multitasking. So, yeah, I think... Yep. I do think eventually another kind of DSN will probably come into play. I think email will be around forever, but I would like to think something will eventually replace it. Um, I as, as Slack has become so, so big and the new hot thing, it makes me want to, to use IRC more and more sometimes because that's, I mean, that's almost more open source-y thing, but you can run... IRC, well, okay, IRC is kind of centralized, but you, it's more of a free program, so you can't, you can, you can host it yourself. I mm -hmm. guess this isn't really a DSN, but yay, open source projects that don't require a single monolithic central uh, repository for a source of truth that is yep. not yourself. Yep, yep. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it, it makes me really conflicted when i think of like centralized systems versus distributed systems because um j just from a general st standpoint like distributed systems are better for a whole lot of reasons but at the same time like centralized systems can offer some really cool features that like distributed systems cannot um and that's something that i am currently struggling with with you know like the the distributed system of podcasts versus like a centralized uh repository of media um but uh yeah that's a discussion for another day <laughs> yes there are definitely trade-offs for both and i think for for users or for people who don't care so much and they just want it to work and be easy a centralized system is um both easier also more profitable for that company who's running it mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, but less likely to be as aggressive about uh, having the, the best interests of the users in mind. Yes, correct. Yeah, whereas a distributed system, inherently, uh, the people running it, um, the people running each instance, have to care about the uh, their, their individual users, because otherwise, we can just leave and join another server and get basically the same experience. You could almost compare it to socialism versus capitalism, right? Oh, here we go. Here's a deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stop there before we go too deep. Okay, okay. It's <laughs> but I'm planting that seed. Food for thought. Coming up with conclusions is left as a, a an exercise for the listener, yes. <laughs> Brandon will explore that topic next. Mm-hmm. All right, so now that we've gotten a good groundwork uh, laid for our understanding of distributed social networks, here is Brandon Johnson to talk to us about a few specific examples of distributed social networks out in the wild. Yeah, for sure. So the one that we're probably here, uh, the, the three of us probably have the most experience with is a relatively recent entrant uh, onto the scene called Mastodon. Uh, it's named for the little, like, what you might think of as a, a fur, uh, woolly mammoth. Um, and I don't know if we have any information on the etymology there, but needless to say, it caught on pretty quick. So there's a lot of things that are kind of uh, up in the air yet about uh, what the communities look like, uh, how mm -hmm. federation works, and, and uh, what this service might develop into over time. Uh, but yeah. Mastodon was built on a protocol called... Er, it was built on top of kind of a, a suite of specifications called GNU Social that came out of the GNU project. If you're familiar with uh, any sort of open source software, you've probably heard of the GNU project. Um, 
-hmm. Yeah, that's... Let's see, that's... Uh, is it a distribution of Linux, or is it the foundation of unit Linux? That's a good question. Let's call it both and neither. I, <laughs> GNU fans are, are famously rabid, and um, rabid's probably a little bit pejorative, isn't it? But GNU fans are, are, are they're like very, very passionate about mm -hmm. um, the particular words that's used to describe their contributions to software. Uh, and I, I, I think that um, their contribution should definitely be acknowledged, but simultaneously, um, language it's evolves. not the kind of yeah. it's, it's not the kind of like uh, group that is going to attract the massive population that a social network needs to flourish right exactly so like, is that a good way of putting it that's a very good way of putting it so for example you use GNU software every day if you have an Android or an iPhone uh, they often don't make software that folks interact with directly which is part of what makes uh, GNU social kind of kind of intriguing. Uh, if you've ever used uh, the an operating system based on Linux, uh, you've probably used GNU software at some point. Um, they have a lot of very specific words they use to describe what they do, and the show isn't about that. But um, they, if you go to their website, you will get very specific definitions of uh, their approach to building uh, free software. Uh, and they would use the term free and not open source. Uh, <laughs> And also their contributions to what you might know as the Linux kernel, but they would likely correct you and say that it's the GNU Linux kernel. Um, so needless to say, uh, as, as you can imagine, with all of those very particular and almost pedantic sounding uh, kind of ways that one needs to talk about GNU, GNU work, the GNU Foundation's work, um, it, it can be often a little bit um, hairy when, when individuals, uh, particularly folks who don't necessarily... Um, who don't necessarily want or need to know all those specifics of of what it, of what free software means, um, uh, or, or, or these very par particular descriptions of of how to interact with free software, um, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't just mean that you the free as in you don't have to pay for it. They mean a very specific set of ideals. Exactly. One one might one might say radically free, um, because mm -hmm. it's it's not just that you don't pay for it. It's that you can look at and modify and run this thing on your own, which we'll get to later, particularly regards to Mastodon. That right. um, the trick is, if you if you make software available in this way, there are often also restrictions on what you can do with that this code that you have access to to modify and run on your own. Uh, often it means that you have to then make any of your modifications also available to the public. And also uh, available free of charge to uh, to modify and reuse and, and run on your own. Now mm -hmm. you can also still make money off of that software. You just have to um, you just have to kind of abide by the terms of that license. So you have to uh, still make the source code available and still make the source code available at no charge, uh, if I recall correctly. Uh, you are just selling a packaged product then instead of instead of selling the source code. Um, right. So it's it's definitely a very political. Uh, and philosophical approach to building software, but that also, you know, while, while I've kind of been perhaps leaning a little bit on the negative side of these, there's some negative aspects of it. There are also a lot of positive aspects that we see come through with Mastodon in particular. The first has got to be its focus on privacy and addressing uh, harassment that's otherwise pre prevalent on um, what what uh, folks on Mastodon might refer to as the bird site. <laughs> Yeah, and and the bird site is very important for mass for understanding Mastodon because Mastodon is very much built to be a replacement for Twitter. Yeah, definitely a reaction to uh, Twitter as well. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first characteristic has got to be that increased character limit, uh, <laughs> right? Like, thank goodness. I I still find myself writing tweets though because I've been writing tweets for so long. Actually, I just realized now that I've been on Twitter for almost ten years to the day. Uh, today, but um, they, I, I, I'm so used to writing in 140 character snippets that like mm -hmm. I, I often don't use the full 500 characters. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes I do, and that's awesome. But uh, other times I don't, uh, and and I get uh, occasionally lampooned for such things on the network. Um, <laughs> but oh, one more thing before before we dive deeper into into Mastodon, back to GNU Social. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, the the GNU project doesn't necessarily um, often make software that uh, 
non-programmers interact with on a, on a frequent basis, so that they decided to launch their own social network is kind of intriguing. And I think it did definitely stay, uh, GNU Social did stay among folks who were, uh, who were already familiar with, uh, with the GNU project. Uh, that, that's, at least, that's at least what I've seen. Um, but simultaneously, some other communities have also fo- uh, followed up here. But what GNU Social really provided to Mastodon and to others is this like uh, protocol suite, like this 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 definition of things that can be used for different instances of some some sort of social network to interoperate. Mm-hmm. So okay, so yeah, so GNU Social was both a particular social network, mm-hmm. but also the underlying tools that allowed that social network to operate can be taken and used to build other federated systems that do not directly interact with GNU social servers. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. They can interoperate too, which is interesting um, because they're all using the same protocols to communicate. It's definitely not out of the question for them to interoperate. It just so happens that um, there are some GNU social instances um, and there are multiple GNU social instances. It's not just GNU social, uh, the the main one. Um, mm-hmm. But there, some some of them have kind of uh, content on them that breaks the codes of conduct for other instances uh, of, of Mastodon in particular. And as such, those instances are blocked. And that's like one of the things that's that's really awesome about Mastodon in particular is that they uh, kind of thought about uh, preventing harassment and preventing um, really preventing hate speech from day one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something that's just is not often the case, even even in uh, free software, almost especially in free software. Yeah, and that's definitely another one of those reactions to a thing that the Twitter community feels that Twitter, the company, is not doing very well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the a lot of these are like manifested as visual features on uh, on Mastodon. So, mm-hmm. uh, for example, you can place any text you like behind a content warning. Uh, mm-hmm. You might have seen these before used for like spoilers or uh, like it's, it's often like done as just like common courtesy if you have like pictures of food or um, you, even like alcohol, right? Like to, to just mm-hmm. to alert people who um, like, for example, folks um, with eating disorders, um, right? It's the same thing with politics, right? Like people often take mm-hmm. politics um, so that if you don't want to see that, you can just scroll past, right? Um, and that's, that's I think, a, one of the things that um twitter has not done yet but mastodon really got right one of the things that's kind of simultaneously awesome and a little thorny about mastodon is that different instances sometimes have different rules about what can be shared on there Uh, yeah and this is one of those things that i really want to get into because it fascinates me right right so there's an instance um i think it's particularly uh a japanese language instance Uh, i don't know if it's hosted Mm -hmm. in japan or not but um the content seems to be uh, mostly in japanese that's uh kind of that other instances in the English language uh, or in like Western regions have kind of been having some difficulty with because that, that instance yeah. had been particularly posting content that's um, without getting too deep into the details, not really considered acceptable. Um, you know, that depicts some kind of nasty stuff um, or uh, just, just like, Things yeah, are not I think I remember. Work. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah, gross. I think I remember seeing the. I, I think I was actually watching the feed go by as um, the creator of Mastodon, Eugen. Yeah. Um, um, was was like posting about what he was going to do uh, f- on his own instance. Um, you know, to to in reaction to that the the Japanese language instance that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it was mostly uh, they're talking about lolly yeah. content being on there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so eventually, I think what he did was he just like blocked, he just like you know broke all federation between his own instance and the, and that other instance, right? Yep, exactly, exactly. And I think a lot of other instances have done that as well. There are some shared instance block lists um, mm-hmm. that if you're setting up your own instance, you can just kind of pull from that and not even have to really. Um, consider that whatsoever but the trick is um, oftentimes when you run an instance um, it, it's not a thing that should be uh, undertaken lightly because oftentimes people expect certain things of their instance admins now now people like you and i who who are talking about like 
the like reasons why people like un, that are like examining reasons why people might start their own instance or how simple it is to get one set up or relatively simple speaking uh, speaking in comparison to like setting up your own twitter right you, which you can't do you'd have to <laughs> right. you'd have to literally write it all from scratch um mm-hmm. like it seems like it's the there's definitely a situation where you could have somebody who sets up an instance because they're looking for a project or something fun to do and i think that should be encouraged but simultaneously too if once you open registrations up to other people other people might see see their instance admin and i think ought to see their instance admin as like somebody who has enormous power right over what goes on over that instance and a responsibility to do right by the people who are using the instance and do right by other people in the federation um and i think that's something that's tricky because that you know at that point you're kind of conferring really kind of heavy stuff onto a person who might you know i mean you know there are people who might not be equipped for it. yeah there are people in high school who are launching instances Um, right yeah because then the the responsibility of controlling your experience on mastodon goes from you know not only the individual user right because you can like block other accounts that you don't want to see you can um you know you've got a few tools like that but also the instance admin Mm -hmm. has a lot of responsibility for what is allowed to get in to the instance from other instances but also they get to decide what their own um content rules are for their instance right for sure so they so they get to dictate what other people are allowed to post on their own instance yeah absolutely and i think like uh, what what this kind of boils down to sociologically really is like this idea of the benevolent dictator for life versus actual um actual like cooperative ownership of a thing so like just Mm -hmm. just because uh something is distributed right so you have multiple instances and that means that anyone can start their own instance by the way um it doesn't necessarily mean that it's still not uh, centralized in that it's controlled by one person or a small number of people uh and there's no like mechanism by which ownership can transfer so like if Mm -hmm. if an instance admin decides they don't want to do this anymore if they if they decide they want to get out of the game shall we say they can literally just shut down the instance with pre- presumably they'd want to do it with some warning, but if they don't want to, right. they could just literally shut down the instance. And that's happened a couple of times on GNU social in particular. Um, and like, that's, that's just a thing that happens. Um, and people don't really have a ton of recourse for it. You can import and export your account, but if the, uh, if the instance goes down without warning, then the instance has gone down and your, your posts are not, retrievable your follows aren't retrievable it's just that's Mm -hmm. it that's the end of it um and so this mm -hmm. this kind of makes me wish that um and i don't think that mastodon has this kind of system um for like other instances to kind of cache posts from other instances right so you you, know you're describing the blockchain right yeah (laughs) you want maybe you want to you want a blockchain for, for mastodon no it makes a lot of sense um because what uh, essentially what the idea of like a blockchain or a distributed ledger is is like this this thing where a bunch of different individuals or groups a bunch of different nodes in a network shall we say can like um agree upon over time what is the what is the truth right so like you've got mm-hmm. um one instance that has a uh, post from these people and one instance that has post from these people and one idea of federation that i don't think has been fully explored yet certainly not a mastodon is that you can say okay these posts are happening and then you linearize them or or normalize them based on what time they were posted and Mm then um if you have one if you have like this instance signs these posts so you can be sure that they're coming from this instance or another level of us would be the posts are signed by the user um but this is like Mm -hmm. kind of heady and complex um but, yeah, I don't think we want uh, the users to have to worry about that kind of thing because then we're not going to have you, you, right. there's, there's going to be too much of a barrier to entry. Right, it's another PGP signed email or whatever, right? Um, so, so what what I think would work instead is if you have at the instance level an instance signs and encrypts its own posts, and then you have posts from other instances kind of interleaved uh, among one another, which allows you to like get some kind of large timeline of the entire quote-unquote federation and Mm -hmm. each each instance might be able to manage the a ledger for their um for all themselves and all the instances that they federate with um Mm -hmm. but um may you know at that point you don't have like a central one uh you just have a bunch of copies of ledgers that that kind of match 
internally with the instance, but also externally with every instance that they federate with. But some instances uh-huh. might federate with instances that that the first instance that I described don't federate with. So right. not no one's ledger is going to be the same. They're just going to be um, internally consistent, not necessarily externally consistent. But if you compare any two messages that, from instances that federate, you should be able to find that they're the same. Um, yeah. And that that's, I think, what what we're getting into there is like, I mean, that's stuff that financial institutions, governments are sorting out right now because they are folks who like crucially need this in order to continue business um, and to, to continue to conduct business online and to authenticate transactions and to have things that are distributed, but also mm-hmm. um, kind of verifiable at a certain level. Um, and I think that's something that Macedon really uh, ought to look into um, in order to kind of lessen some of these concerns with um like any one instance going down right for example right then you'd be able right. to go to any instance that um you federate with and just essentially pull back your entire your entire history if you want to but then you also run into storage concerns a lot of these mastodon instances are run on rather small servers run inexpensively yeah. by individuals or small small groups and if that's a case like very few people are going to want to pay for that kind of storage um it's not, mm-hmm. I, I mentioned that it's like a blockchain thing, but it's not exactly like Bitcoin. You don't need like a ton of computational power in order for this to work. It's not like Bitcoin is artificially exponential in computational cost. Um, right. But like blockchains don't need to be that way. But over time, it is like increasing monotonically how much, how much costs, how much it costs to continue to store all that data. Um, mm-hmm. But like, it's, it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be good enough, right? It's not, like, any individual might not be willing to, to foot that bill. Right. Yeah. Cause I remember when we first started talking about Mastodon and I was, you know, figuring out like, okay, so I want to, I want to go and join Mastodon, but the, you know, the Mastodon.social, yep. which is the flagship instance, wasn't uh, accepting new registrations at the time because, you know, that, that was like in the middle of the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the big surge. I feel like in part um, that might have been by design too because so much of a distributed social network is basically saying there is no flagship, right? Certainly because right. that's the yeah. one that's run by Eugen. And like if he probably pretty quickly wanted folks to find other instances because if you have everyone mm-hmm. everyone mm-hmm. on one instance, then it's no longer distributed. But continue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I remember asking you, uh, like, does it matter which instance I choose? And you were you were just like, no, not really. Um, but uh, several weeks out, now I realize that actually it kind of does because um, whoever is running your instance is going to determine a lot of different things from what you're going to see, you know, who what other instances you're allowed to interact with, but also like... Uh, the kinds of assurances that I have mm-hmm. that the instance is going to continue, you know, that they're a- that they actually have skin in the game, right? Um, I have I have no idea who the admin is of, of Mastodon dot cloud. So <laughs> oh, uh, I, that's right, because you're you're on Mastodon dot cloud. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like I know the I feel like I know the admin for that one. I don't. Uh... I I suspect they're in France. Oh, there seems gotcha. to be a lot of French stuff going on on my instance. Gotcha. I'll take a look. Um, they usually have like an about. Yes, I have gone to the about, and their their um account name for the admin is just the admin. Oh, we're right. I think I follow them. Uh, the admin at mastodon.cloud. Oh yeah, sure enough, I do follow them. Um, yes, French and English. So my my instance is also French, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. dot xyz is also French. Um. There are a couple of other folks who run Mastodon instances that I believe are also French or, or Europe-based. Uh, Eugen himself is, is I think, in Germany? Question mark? Yes, he is. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yes, got that one right. Um, um, mm-hmm. Assuming that the person whose Patreon page is, is linked to from the Mastodon.cloud slash about page, um, his name is Valentin Ovoard. Ah, that's an if I'm, awesome name. If I'm pronouncing my French awfully (laughs) no that's awesome that's awesome ah yeah so good and like that's another component to this too that's really interesting is because a lot of these folks need to really like socialize throughout the instance that yeah that this is cool but there's one person who's who's keeping the lights on uh so Mm -hmm. i give both to my instance admins two of my instance admins one person who is not on any of my instances um 
Uh, but just because I know that this person is an admin and is super awesome and I want to support their work. And actually, that, that this, this goes into kind of the sustainability of Mastodon as well. Mm-hmm. Is, um, you know, there, there is, like, when they first set it up, one of the core tenets was we don't want to have a system that is supported by ads. Right. Um, and so, yeah, the, the creator of the whole system, uh, he has a Patreon. Um, he also obviously like runs an instance. Mm-hmm. So he has a, he like people on his own instance uh, are encouraged to, to um, contribute to that, to, to help run that server. Um, but each and every single one of the, uh, instance creators, they can also have their own Patreons because obviously, um, yeah, they have server infrastructure that that requires money to to keep running. Right. Um, right. Absolutely. And it's like and 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 for the most part, like I haven't heard of any Mastodon instances that have advertising on there. But I, I, it's technically possible. Yeah. I. There's no reason you couldn't do that. For sure. There are uh, some companies that actually run their own Mastodon instances, and it's not for advertising purposes. It's so that people at their company can mm-hmm. access Mastodon. Like that's it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like there you go. I feel like that's the perspective that folks need to have, really. I don't I don't necessarily think that every office should have a Mastodon instance, but I think that um I think that there's real benefit for companies that want to understand what this network is all about. One of the things that I'm hoping will happen at some point, because I know a lot of folks from the operations world, from like the network ops world are watching this. Um, I'm hoping that a company like DigitalOcean, uh or I don't know, maybe even Rackspace oh. would like kick in and be like, you know, we we know why this is a thing and we don't really want anything returned for this, but we want to support the development of this thing because we get distributed systems uh, and we want we want this to be a thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's something, you know, I think a whoever whoever does do that, should they do that? I would I would be a customer of that company or continue to be a customer of that company for a very long time. And I think a lot of other people would too. Um, or even like provide free hosting for Mastodon instances. Um, if Twitter realized the kind of things that are happening on Mastodon are things that that they would want to happen on Twitter, maybe that's not the case. But I, I feel like anyone who's used Mastodon can see that there are lessons Twitter can learn from this. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe they could contribute to the development of Mastodon as well or contribute to... Um, to the community broadly to to help make sure this thing exists because there i mean some could like in a classical sense if you only analyze them as two entities right you might be able to consider macedon a twitter competitor but ultimately yeah. they're not going to take down twitter i mean probably how, not how many users does twitter have right now twitter user count twitter has 319 million monthly active users <laughs> which um considering that we're at half a million that's not that's not like a danger like there's no danger there to twitter i feel like mm-hmm. you know mastodon is still like wildly popular for something that sprung out of GNU, uh, the GNU software foundation but it's not like so powerful that it's taking over the world um no yeah though though considering that um like the its largest point of growth was something like 12,000 users uh joining yeah. um on on top of an existing 20,000 users right so or yeah they, it, they they more than doubled the number of users that they had in like 2 days um yeah which is you know which is like insane <laughs> yeah absolutely like the, the the spurts of growth are amazing but it's it's not like um they're not trying to take away twitter's ad revenue they're not trying to take away um the kind of paid communication that Twitter's there for. They're trying, they're trying to do something different, like mm-hmm. fundamentally different. And I think um, Twitter is in a really unique position to support the development of something different. If they would only recognize that that's, that's like, that's something that they should support or could support. Right. Um, I don't think Facebook could care less about, about <laughs> Mastodon whatsoever. Like uh, Facebook is a very different company from many perspectives, but in no small part from an engineering perspective, um, I'm cool with Facebook continuing to develop great UI frameworks and other tools that other people can use. Um, I don't think they have any interest whatsoever in Mastodon. Um, just like I, I don't imagine that they have interest in um, really 
any other kind of startup social network. I don't think they really cared about Ello when everyone wrote the think pieces about Ello. I don't think they really cared about <laughs> Peach when people wrote the think pieces about Peach. I wrote think pieces about both of these things, admittedly, uh, and both of them fizzled out in a couple weeks. Mastodon doesn't... Please tell me I can find those on... Oh, yeah, I do remember actually <sighs> reading those. probably yeah. already read them, and also those are on that... Um, that uh, VPS that I uh, unceremoniously uh, sent to the fires of hell. Um, however, I do still have Brandon. I do still have copies. Should you wish to read them, I just haven't bothered setting that up again on my new instance yet. Right. Yeah. It probably it probably would have been a good idea to save those, but mm. I see. I I tend to be of, of the opinion that um, it is oftentimes the opinions that I don't write down that I wish I had saved, and the ones that I do write down are the ones often that are less <laughs> are less worth saving um but that's a, that's a story for a different episode so actually um the fact that your blog is no longer online uh kind of speaks to the some of some of the the tensions the the pros and cons between a centralized system and a decentralized system for sure. um because like you know people people so often tell you like oh yeah if you're if you're setting up um you know a blog or a podcast or something like that you got to make sure that you own like the whole stack that you own the server space and everything that you're not relying on something like um you know soundcloud or whatever for hosting or you know because like if that platform goes away then all of your content goes away Mm -hmm. and if you're not paying attention anymore you know if this is like an old archived um show uh then then you know nobody's going to be able to find your stuff anymore right um on the other hand if you yourself decide that you don't feel like keeping the site online it just goes away right oh yeah whereas like where whereas if i have like an old youtube channel that i put up long long ago it's not taking any effort on my part it's not you know i'm not paying any hosting or anything like that um (laughs) so um it's yeah it's hard to say which which model has more longevity in terms of like the old content um sticking around oh totally you know, and staying archived <laughs> absolutely absolutely see so i uh i'm kind of an outlier in that i hold myself in very low esteem and i hold my thoughts in rather low oh, esteem Brandon. so i well you know it's it's di- it's different from having low self esteem it's it's um i just when i when i look at um when I look at my blog posts in particular, one of them I did for a class assignment at the U and I was like, you know what? I'm cool with this. I'm, I'm cool if I just keep this for myself from now on. Right. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I looked at the, you know, the GA results and I looked at how, how dead that blog was. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to figure out something else to do with this. And I'm totally cool with that. Anyhow. So back to instances. Um, so I, I guess really what this all comes down to is like, um, the thing about Mastodon that's that's interesting is more more than anything that it can be set up by anyone and it can be maintained by anyone. It doesn't necess- you don't have to be beholden to any particular individual or any particular instance to to manage your content. Now, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people tend to think too that this this has um, some some interesting kind of um, sociological economic effects, almost right. I mean, not economic in terms of money, but economic in terms of like. Um, economic systems, right? So, like when you when you trust your uh, your instance admin to have like certain thing, certain certain responsibilities, right? They can they're human and they can fall short, right? They might have a different perspective than you do. They might have different expectations than you do on a certain right. thing. And the the nature of the system is such that you can move to a different instance if you don't if you don't like that. Um, but the right. trick is one thing you often can't do uh, is you can't find any other recourse other than simply talking to the instance admin, right? Like there's not like a, a judicial system per se. Um, yeah, yeah. And you know, like Twitter, there's, there's not even really, there's, there's a mechanism to report people, but it's not like a, it's not like a suggestion box, right? There's not, there's, it's not a democracy really um, for, for, to, to, to use an awful cliche. Um, it's, it's not, it's truly not a democracy, right? Um, so some people have been proposing like setting up a governance structure for an instance. And I think that makes a lot of sense, certainly for Mm. large instances where you have like this idea that the instance admins will be voted in, um, and kind of almost like a cooperative structure, which is fascinating and awesome. Goodness. It's, it's awesome, right? It's like a, it's like a microcosm of reality really, but it's, it's like, um, but some people just might not care for that formalism. Um, however, of course, yeah, I mean, I, I have 
trouble enough keeping up on uh you know all levels of politics uh, in the real world uh and trying to keep track of like um admins on a, a mastodon instance and voting for who i want to be in office that sounds like too much for me right right and i think a lot of that too has to deal with this like decision fatigue right like at the at this at yeah. this point nobody really no, but like oftentimes nobody really has strong opinions about who's running their instance. And if you do have strong opinions about it, then, you know, if, if, if you were on an instance that has this governance structure, where you're able to vote in somebody, you can probably run and win because they will pick the one name for the one person that stood mm. up and that's you. Right. <laughs> um, on the, yeah. On the other hand, like how do you keep accountable in a system like that? Where like, do will we have like a uh, a, a press corps develop in uh, you know Mastodon instances where that you know they uh, they keep tabs on uh, on what the admin is doing so that other people on that instance don't have to like right. this. <laughs> do, do we do yeah, how far uh, how closely do we mirror our own like entire society uh, in a small group of you know. 20,000 people right right i mean at, 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 a cer- <laughs> at a certain point if we continue this out of infinitum then you're like you're you're going until until the cows come home right like you, sure you can yeah. develop an enforcement squad or whatever right that like at an executive branch you can develop a, a legislative branch and a judicial branch you can have people creating policy you can have people uh you know uh making making judgment calls about whether policy was followed or not and you can have you can you can develop that if you wish but i think what's often the case is that really it's all about uh, like finding people who um who are generally speaking known quantities or trusted in the community for whatever definition mm-hmm. that is uh and by the community of course we're also talking about the people who show up to to care to vote for folks um but th- that's kind of that's really more of like a a large instance problem because if you if you have if you have an instance that's so small like if it's you and 20 other people more likely than not if, if the nexus uh set up our own <laughs> mastodon.thenexus.tv right we would it wouldn't make sense to to vote on it because we don't have enough uh, a pool enough of folks that we would really be voting anyone in or out and we mm-hmm. likely would not have enough conflict that, <laughs> that we want to vote anyone out in so many ways it's just like um there's like there's there's so many other things to be concerned about i t- tend to be of the opinion that unless the instance is so large and um the the potential for disagreement or the potential for mismanagement is so 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 strong that you have to um that you really feel like you need to have like a transition plan in place or anything like that if any if anything is too important right too too big to fail mm-hmm. shall we say um then then i think the system is kind of maybe it's time to break out into more instances right um right because if 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 you uh if it's a big deal when you see the mastodon admins motorcade go by uh (laughs) you may have too many people right right i mean so much so much of the so much of the idea behind a distributed network is that nothing matters so much that it can't disappear and everyone will be fine um and i think i think that's kind of a difficult scenario because you sure you still have to have people who are um who are managing this and who have some semblance of responsibility, but it, it like that, that thing that, that allows the individual to continually like protect their own, like their own presence, right. Their own presence on, on the mm-hmm. instance and to feel comfortable mm-hmm. and to feel safe is the same thing that kind of has to, has to really check any sort of yeah. like strong development of of centralization really which is what any sort of government structure really is like centralization on any distributed node is kind of antithetical to to what what they're after not that it's not like possible and not that it's not interesting and not that it's, it's not a good fit for certain communities but it's like um it, it probably shouldn't become the norm i mean i may, maybe i'm editorializing too much to say it shouldn't become the norm but it just it to me it kind of rubs me the wrong way i guess right and I just realized that um, one of the the earlier concerns that I had is just kind of like the tip of the iceberg because I mentioned that like if if my instance suddenly goes down and the admin is has no interest in in you know bringing it back online, um, then I lose all of like my previous toots, yep. right? You lose the everything. previous posts, yep. but I also lose out on 
like the the people who I have accrued as as acquaintances on this system, right? How do I communicate with them all now that I don't have uh, access to my account? And frankly, my account doesn't exist anymore, right? right? Um, how do I communicate with them that like, okay, I'm on this other instance now. This is my new username, et cetera. Right. That's, that's, a, that's a really tough problem to solve. For sure, for sure. And then like... Uh, on the flip side of that too, right? Like what, from an instance admin perspective, if you're like, I don't know, moving to a different country and you can't maintain this account anymore because the the credit card that it's attached to will no longer exist and they don't accept credit cards from whatever other country you're moving to, right? Or some some weird yeah. scenario happens like that. Like as, as an individual, like I could see a situation where you wouldn't be able to keep that online and you just have to be like, okay, guys, time to, time to you know, you got two days, right? <laughs> tell everyone you tell everyone you want to know, and like, like, uh, sync up with them real quick because this is this is a hard, you know, shutdown date, and and there's not going to mm-hmm. be much after that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like so, something interesting. Um, and I think the the reason why this isn't we haven't seen more like interesting solutions around this, perhaps quite yet, is um, I, have you ever heard of Crunchbang Linux? No. Uh, so it, it it was a Linux distribution a couple of years ago. Uh, that was created by a single person who um, is is from the UK, just an, just an individual, and he essentially wrapped the Debian Linux distribution it, with a bunch of tools that he found helpful, a bunch of kind of customizations um, that kind of mm-hmm. gave a little bit better out of the box experience than just running Debian on your own. Um, okay. So it was it was pretty heavily customized, but I really liked it for the longest time. And at a certain point, he was like, you know, um, I can't really. I can't really be maintaining this in the same way that I used to anymore. So I'm just going to kind of leave the mirrors up for a little while. And if somebody else wants to take this on, um, I'll leave it up for as long as I can, but you know, I have to give it a hard end date and it's going to be in, you know, we'll, we'll say it. I, I don't remember the actual thing, but we'll say it's in like three months. Right. And okay. immediately, immediately there were folks who were like, I want, I want to keep this going. So they took, they cloned the, the, the mirrors, uh that that he had set up and they they took uh as much of the source code as they could down and i I believe all of it and um gave it a new kind of organizational structure that um was pretty simple but it's still it's still like centered around three or four maintainers and Mm -hmm. they were able to kind of keep it going under a new name um i think it's called bunsen os now let me see uh yes that's it bunsen labs linux and it still looks remarkably similar to, um, remarkably similar to the one that I remember using like five or six years ago. Yeah, and I think we've seen this kind of thing happen a few times surrounding the death of a project, um, and not all of them are like uh, open source projects sure. either. Like you know, um, obviously you know, CyanogenMod mod uh, went away fairly recently. Lineage, uh, you know, the community moved over there. Right. Um, to to this new new venture, um, but even like closed source things, like when Google Reader uh, was shut down, there were like a bunch of different um, companies that kind of popped up saying like, "Hey, we're making an RSS reader. Please like feel free to export all of your uh, all of your existing feeds and just stick them in here." Right. Um, and actually, I think some of them even let you just like log in with your Google account and automatically transfer them over. Oh, for sure. Um, and uh, and I think one in particular was like recreating the back end mm-hmm. um, system that Google Reader had. That's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, just yeah. I mean, if if something is is important enough to people, uh, yeah, I think they'll they'll find a way to keep it going. Right, right. I think one of the things that this doesn't solve, and I think one of the things that um, free software often doesn't necessarily have an answer for, is like, how, what, what, what is the impact here at the margins, right? If there's something that's really important to a small number of people, um, but those people might not have the, the the tools or equipment or time or or, or like currency or, or capital, shall we say, to to mm-hmm. to recreate or continue that, like, how how do we make sure that the systems that are built serve those folks as well and right you know that's a tricky problem that i think society societally we don't have um necessarily a good answer for but i think it's something still that can be kept in mind um you know oftentimes what happens with with some things you know like visibility is often uh for for this stuff is kind of limited to just whatever you are watching or whatever whatever a large number of people are watching 
Um, so it's probably going to be the case that there are a lot of like situations where where instances might fail um, or instances in this scenario or, or in other scenarios like it might fail and um, the like the the system might lose some users as a result and those folks won't like come back and that'll be that um, mm-hmm. but I yeah I don't know it's it's a, it's a difficult problem to solve but it's one that's that's kind of pervasive uh, along all sorts of open source software so I guess uh, that's that's kind of the the end of that particular sociological thread for me. Um, <laughs> but I guess there's there's st- definitely still some some more things to discuss. Um, I think one of the interesting things about this is like all the media attention it generated, um, mm-hmm. right? Because um, a, 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 in a lot of situations, um, like tech press and uh, marketing press are often really keen to jump on things that they might see as like the next big thing, the next Twitter, the next uh, blah, 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 Snapchat, the next Facebook. Um, and it's kind of interesting because a lot of, a lot of these weren't really, a lot of these weren't really like positive, right? I mean, so uh, the, the creator of Macedon, uh, Eugene, who we've mentioned a couple of times, had it like an introductory mm-hmm. post um, as did a couple of other folks from the community just created posts. Uh, and actually the verge has a post I see on here. Um, that's essentially it's titled a beginner's guide to Mastodon, on the hot new open source Twitter clone. Uh, yeah, it's essentially, um, fr- from like a, from the perspective of somebody who's not looking at the technical side of things so much. Um, a lot of these are super fascinating essentially a lot of those posts are often like oh this thing's gonna die and nobody's gonna use it and you know it's never gonna take down twitter i don't i don't think many places have the mis have the conception uh the concept in their mind that this is going to take down twitter i don't think it will but i think it is something that provides a new thing almost in addition to twitter that um Mm -hmm. otherwise folks wouldn't really have access to or wouldn't really be able to try out. And I think that's, that's the thing that's interesting about it. I don't really like, I, I talk about this almost like it's conceptual art uh, and maybe it is, but I don't, I don't feel like it. I feel like it's a little more than that too. I feel like there's a community that can continue to thrive here, but I think um, the way that it's being talked about in the tech press and in the popular press um, really reflects this. There are a couple, there are a couple of posts here and there that were kind of like, Oh, you know, this thing's going to evaporate. But I think, um, the majority of it kind of sees the the value in it and sees the the potential for longevity, not because it'll take down Twitter, but because it doesn't need to take down Twitter. Yeah, and even like mm, I get so exhausted with you know thinking about like uh, how many different social networks there are out for there sure. and how many different people use all of these different places, and if you know if you want to see all of the content from all of them. So many of them are like completely closed systems mm-hmm. where you can only interact with them if you are currently signed in and using their app, right? right? Um, we're a long ways away from the the blogging days of yore where, uh, you know, everything would just, you know, could come to you as an RSS feed mm-hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and you could be happy uh, <laughs> even if you don't have, you know, a WordPress account totally, yeah. or a Tumblr account or, you know, um, even, even like uh, Twitter, you know, that you, there are ways to just grab all of the public posts that somebody puts up. Um, but uh, yeah, like it, it's just like fragmenting all of our interactions across all of these different um all of these different systems is not a desire of mine. No, for sure. That's for sure. For sure. And, you know, admit, admittedly, I often check uh, Twitter, Snapchat, both of my Mastodon instances and occasionally Facebook. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of that's because, like, these things fulfill very different needs for me. I often don't feel mm-hmm. like Snapchat is consuming content, for example. Snapchat, for me, is often, I mean, of all things, I use it to, like... Um, you know, I, I guess I've been saying this for years, but I, I use Snapchat to schedule meetings sometimes, right? I use Snapchat to talk <laughs> to talk with my coworkers, to share interesting pictures and, and videos of weird stuff that I see. And that's that's like one of the things that I really like about Snapchat is that like I can just kind of capture weird moments and share them with people um, because I feel like that's almost the content. And, you know, paradoxically, that's almost the content I want to save more than 
like my my particular weird one-off blog post that i wrote for class at one point right mm-hmm. i i want to save mm-hmm. this weird stuff that i don't necessarily know the value of right now um but that it might at some point bring back the same memories for me that you got from looking at like old school projects and stuff um, right. like i just looked through ironically you did that on a system on a platform that's designed uh, to expire where... things yeah <laughs> yep yep yeah um i know ne- i never said it was logical um but <laughs> yeah so, so that that's like one of the things i get get out of snapchat i also out of macedon i've noticed that there's a lot of folks that i would have never interacted with on twitter um mm-hmm. and i think that's that community on macedon particularly on macedon at xyz also on cyber.space um they're both really unique communities and i'm really really excited to see how they develop over time if they develop over time or even if nothing else is to keep in touch with the folks that i have met so far in the like three weeks that i've been on this thing and so like i guess the the differing utility of these things and like i guess for me it might be more pronounced for me than it is for other people but like really my rss feed is twitter my um like one-to-one communication mechanism or even like one-to-many is mostly snapchat Mastodon is also kind of conversational, but definitely many to many and not one to many. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Facebook, I don't even know what you call Facebook. Facebook is a, a thing I maintain. <laughs> <laughs> a presence that you have. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I, I know it makes it sound like such drudgery, right? It's really not that much work, but... <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, if you made it this far into the uh, episode, I congratulate you. Um, thanks for sticking around with us. Um, there's, the, yeah, there was a lot to unpack here uh, for sure for this, um, for this, because this is a subject that most people have never ever like had to think about before, um, and uh, I, certainly I hadn't really thought of it uh, until Mastodon became a thing. Um, but yeah, if you uh, if you have thoughts on the subject, um, if you want to give us feedback, feel free uh, to do so at um, the nexus at gmail.com or hit us up uh, ironically on Twitter at, at the nexus TV. Um, wait, did I say the nexus at gmail.com? It is the nexus the TV, nexus at, TV at, gmail. at gmail.com. Yes. Yeah. Um, Brandon and I are both on Mastodon. Um, it's true. I am Ian Arbuck at mastodon.cloud. And I'm Brandon at Mastodon.xyz. That's my public account. And you can find me on Mastodon at Brian Mitch L at Mastodon.cloud. You can also find me on a more central place like Twitter. Uh, and my handle there is Brian Mitch L. Yep. And uh, you can also find me on Twitter if you want at Ian R. Buck. And you can find me on Twitter where I'm Brandon underscore MN. See you around. Adios. Have a good one. <laughs>